Once more, for the first time since Operation Crossroad in 1946, Bikini took its place in the story of atomic testing. The date was March 1, 1954. This photograph was taken from an airplane at 50 miles. The width of the fireball at this time, about three seconds after detonation, was four miles. The frame size of the picture is six by eight miles. The top of the fireball at this time, 40 seconds after detonation, was five miles above sea level. It proved that we can have a high yield weapon weighing less than 10 tons. The tremendous yield resulted in a serious fallout situation at Bikini and certain other atolls downwind from ground zero. George shot. Zero point was the island of Eberiru. George left a crater 1,000 feet across and 10 feet deep. Mike. Zero was the island of Ilujalab. The crater was one mile in diameter and sloped down to a maximum of 175 feet. An entire island was vaporized and sections of islands on either side were chopped off. This is the island of Enenman, Bikini Atoll, 15 miles from zero point, the first shot of Operation Castle. This too is Enenman, 15 miles from zero. Castle provided the military with the opportunity to record and study the effects of multi-megaton weapons and aided them in the revision of previous military concepts dealing with low-yield capabilities. For example, initial gamma radiation at ranges of concern was only about one-tenth of the predicted intensity. It was found that initial gamma from high-yield weapons becomes militarily unimportant in those ranges where blast and thermal continue to cause almost 100% casualties outside of heavy bunkers. Measurements of neutron spectrum and flux were made. But while the neutron flux was heavy, it attenuated so rapidly with distance that no military value was attached. The significance of fallout from high yield surface detonations becomes increasingly important from the military viewpoint. Fallout begins with the millions of tons of earth vaporized or thrown out by the explosion. It traps radioactive fission products while being drawn to great heights within the cloud. The main fallout pattern appears to have been dominated by winds between 20,000 and at least 70,000 feet, with some influence exerted on the pattern by winds outside this band. A shower of radioactive particles drop from the cloud as it is carried along by these winds at rates determined by individual particle size, so that many hours are required before the pattern is complete. Although fallout was studied in the classic way, the high yield plus a wind factor caused contamination of distant populated atolls, providing a completely new source of study on these effects and showing graphically the tremendous area of contamination from a high yield surface burst. 229 natives and 28 American service personnel received doses ranging from 12 to 200 Rentgens. Shortly after the shot, they were evacuated to Kwajalein for treatment and observation. None of the doses appeared to reach levels of immediate combat significance, nor did the people suffer severe effects. Also of great significance was determination of what appears to be the main fallout pattern. This pattern is difficult to predict and is subject to many variables. It settles to earth in a design which can reasonably be called a long leaf shape. 
Analysis of data indicates that, for a surface detonation of a high-yield weapon, an area of approximately 7,000 statute square miles can be covered by contamination at levels that might be lethal to some 50% of exposed humans. Some approximate areas such a fallout pattern could encompass within the United States would be an area running from Milwaukee east beyond Detroit, from Denver east to Lincoln, Nebraska, from Los Angeles east to Flagstaff, Arizona. In summary, the fallout from high-yield surface bursts, such as those during Castle, presents many problems related to civil defense. However, passive defense can drastically reduce casualties.